Well, this little collection of talks is called Simid Nap. It's the third week together, so can we try it all together? Simid Nap. Have you been working on it? Some of you know, yes, practicing at home. Simid Nap is pandemic spelled backwards because we're celebrating a God who restores. And what we tried to say and what we have been saying in these, these talks is that you're going to make it. In the last two messages, that's really what we were focusing on. If, if the pandemic has left a mark on you, if there's a big loss because of the pandemic in your story, God is going to bring you through. The message is God restores. And yes, there's been loss, but God repays for the years that the locusts have eaten. And so if, you, if that's where you are, there are two talks parked there for you. This message today is for us collectively as the church. And the message today is coming out of global pandemic, we're going to make it and the church is going to make it. I was hoping people would be excited about that. You say, well, Louie, I don't know if you're really paying attention or not, because every statistic and every article I'm reading saying that the church is shrinking, people are leaving the church, lots of people are leaving the church, a lot of people left the church and didn't come back to church. You can go to almost every church today, and there's less people there than there were when pandemic started, so how can you encourage us and assure us today that the church is going to make it? Because God is a God who restores, and God's committed to the church, and On top of that, a shrinking church is not necessarily a weaker church. A weakened church is a weaker church. And so the church, theoretically, could get smaller and be stronger. So we're not counting up how many people come through the door. What we're really interested in is what kind of church are we? And I know that God doesn't waste anything, and God certainly isn't going to waste us going through a pandemic. And so how does he want to use that to shape the church? Well, I think in a few simple ways. Number one, I think that the church after the pandemic, God wants it to be a church that is awake and alert and wise. Awake, alert, and wise. If you look in Ephesians chapter five, this is what Paul is encouraging. And the times in Ephesians apparently were challenging Uh, He calls them many times in this book, evil days. The days are evil in the book of Ephesians. And so he says in verse one of chapter five, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, he's talking to these believers now, he's saying, let's focus on us now. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral or impure or greedy person because such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. So all of a sudden, Paul is putting us in a context where there is conflict and the church is caught in the middle of it, the people are caught in the middle of it, how are we gonna live? And he comes on down a little bit later in this passage in in verse 14 he says for it is light that makes everything visible that is why it is said wake up O sleeper rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you and this is God's word for us as his people in this moment coming through what we've all come through he says wake up be awake in this moment I know when I was failing out of Georgia State, one of the the things that got me completely out, the the nail in the coffin, I think, was my art history class, which I loved and did learn a lot in, by the way. We were just in Europe looking at masterpieces, and a lot of that served me well. But the class didn't go great because I 
missed a bunch of time, crammed for the final all night long, going through this big thick book, trying to memorize all these paintings and all these painters and all these different movements of time in art. And then we get to the exam and it doesn't, hasn't dawned on me that at the exam that I've stayed up all night studying for, as soon as the exam starts uh, in this big theater where the class is, all the lights go off and paintings are now being projected onto the screen. And it's completely dark in the room. And when the room went dark, I also went dark and just put my head straight down, no kidding, on the desk, just like this, and just slept until a a kind person tapped me on the shoulder as everyone was leaving after the exam. And we just got to make sure that when the lights go out around us, that our heads aren't on the desk and we're just sleepwalking through life but that we are awake he's saying wake up wake up sleeper he's not saying make sure you're at church on Sunday he's saying wake up he's not saying make sure that you're a Christian he's saying wake up yes you should be in church on Sunday and yes for crying out loud you want to follow Jesus but Wake up, there's a, there's a way that you can be living in a world that's crumbling and you're asleep in the midst of it. And he's saying, you gotta be awake. And not only that, you've gotta be alert. He says a few verses later in, in verse 10 of chapter six, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. He said, be alert. Why? Because the devil has schemes. There is a devil, and he's got plans for you, schemes for you. The the, the schemes are getting a little less schemey. It used to be that you had to play the records backwards to hear the satanic messages. (laughs) Anybody back in that era? But now you can play some of the records forwards. Why? Why? Because the schemes are a little less schemey now. And the darkness has got a plan for you. Jesus said the seed, some of it fell on the path and the birds ate it. Some of it fell in these thorns and the thorns were just the stuff of life and they just choked out those plants. Some fell on rocky ground and they got a great start but they didn't have any roots and they faded away. And some fell in good soil. Schemes, all different kinds of schemes. And what God is saying is, you gotta be alert. You've got to be awake and you have to be alert. You have to be able to discern the time. That last thing, and wise. If you go back to chapter five, right after he says, wake up, O sleeper, and rise from the dead. And look what happens when you do. Christ shines on you. Light shines on you. He says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because here it comes again, because the days are evil. So when Paul is writing this 2,000 years ago, in Ephesus, it was evil. And he's saying in the midst of an evil time that we're living in, be careful how you live. And and don't walk like unwise people, but walk like wise people, understanding what the will of God is. Do not get drunk, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, And he closes this section by saying, submit to one another out of reverence 
for Christ. We'll come back to that at the end. Don't be drunk because that's a waste is the word in Greek. He basically is saying 2,000 years ago, don't get wasted because it's a waste. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And why did he put these two ideas together? Because one shows what being under the influence of something looks like. And he wanted the other one to show what being under the influence of something looked like. And the primary shift of what being under the influence of spirit looked like was the way you speak. Interesting. Lots of other ways. Whole chapter filled with other ways. But the primary way here is, it's the way you talk to each other is what's changing under the influence of the spirit and he calls them evil days and he's trying to help us understand that we are not up against flesh and blood we are up against spiritual powers your neighborhood is a spiritual municipality your family lives in a spiritual municipality this city is in a spiritual municipality and we just can't show up and you know, sing some songs and then rock on out of here and go, man, that was a great Sunday. When we're living in a spiritual municipality, we have to be awake and alert and wise. What should I do? Do the wise thing. Weigh up God's word. Submit to one another in community. And then when you make the decision, make the wise decision because you understand what God's will is in this moment. This is how the church looks going forward into the future. In 1 John chapter 2, John is also speaking of the end times. And I know that's a big question. You know, is this the end? And I, I don't know the answer to that. It could certainly be. God knows that. The richest people on earth definitely do not think this is the last days. But, but they're not running the world, so it could be the last day. I mean, they're investing for things that are happening 10, 15, 20, 100 years into the future, creating some world that all of us uh, are probably going to have to live in at some point. But God knows. And that could be today, or it could be a day in God's time. This message is called Wide Awake at the Dawn of the End of Time. Asterisk. And the asterisk is just, it has to be there because I, I don't know. The asterisk says, uh, down at the bottom, boilerplate, this will go somewhere down at the bottom of the thing. Time is a relative term in the sense that the Almighty who created time exists outside of time and counts a thousand years as a day, and a day is a thousand years. Therefore, being at the end of time on earth as we know it could mean literally today as in a moment within this 24-hour period or in it could mean one more day as in a thousand more years. But it's definitely the end of time. We're at the end of time. And all through scripture, the writers being led by the Holy Spirit are bringing us to think like people of the second coming. It doesn't mean that we need a poster that says the end is near and we're you know, marching up and down the sidewalk. It just means that we wake up in the day and we're like, we're people of the second coming. So that's informing everything that's happening in our life. And in 1 John chapter two, John is sharing with his listener and reader the same. Dear children, verse 18, this is the last hour. And as you've heard that the antichrist is coming, even now, many antichrists have come. And this is what we're up against. We're up against the spirit that is anti Christ. It may be anti this right now and anti this tomorrow and anti this on another day, but ultimately the spirit that is moving in the world is against Christ. So be ready because where this culminates is with an antichrist spirit. So yes, there are important things for us to talk about. There are important ways for us to live our lives. There are important light to be shined into our story but ultimately, it all is pointing to being against Christ. And their spirits 
of Antichrist right now. And a discerning, alert, awake person can sense what is happening around them. He says, even now, many antichrists have come. This is how we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belong to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. Church, you have an anointing from the Holy One. And all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the antichrist. He denies the father and the son. No one who denies the son has the father. Whoever acknowledges the son has the father also. See that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the son and in the Father, and this is what he promised us, even eternal life. When Jesus sent his followers out in Matthew 10, he said, I'm sending you into the world as sheep among wolves. So I want you to be as innocent as doves and as smart as snakes. I want you to be awake and alert and wise. The second thing about this church coming through the pandemic is that the church is humble and bold. I put these two words together because we need humility in our lives. James 4 says, not smart if you're going around telling everybody Like in February, our family's going to Tuscany and uh, next August, we're gonna open our fourth location of our snow cone stand. And on November 3rd, we're all lined up to have this public offering for our stock. And he says, no, 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 that's foolish talk. When you talk, you should talk like this. If the Lord wills, next February, we're planning to go to Tuscany. If the Lord wills, we're planning to open a fifth snow cone stand. If the Lord wills, this is our plan. Yes, we're making plans, but it's if God wills. I, I'm just dialing my mind back to being in the bins on New Year's Eve 2020, going into the roaring 20s. Here we come into the roaring 20s with a stadium full of people, and 75 days later, the entire world comes to a halt. And I wonder, what, what would we have done anything different Would we have thought differently, taught differently, moved differently if someone had just walked up with a note and said, hey, by the way, you're gonna be one of the last events in this stadium for a while. We need in our vocabulary to recapture the humility of not knowing on what day the world's gonna come to a stop. And we need to be able to say, you know what? I would love to meet you uh, next Friday if God wills. You're like, Louie, that's just gonna be silly if we just start putting that in every sentence. Okay, just have it in your mind. And you don't have to put it in the sentence. If God wills. That's one of the the marks that should be on us coming out of pandemic. We we don't know. We don't know how much time we have. We don't know how many days we have. We, we, We don't know what's on the other side of next week. So let's just be humble before God. But with that, he says, I need you to be bold. When we were uh, starting this series, we were in Joel 2, and the prophet is talking about God repaying what the locusts have eaten. And he comes down to the middle of chapter 2, and he says, yes, you're going to be autumn rains and spring rains, and your crops are going to grow. Your threshing floor is going to be full. Your vats are going to have new wine and new oil. And this is like the restoration of God. But then he comes down to to the next verse, and he says, and... And when I was reading this, I'm like, why is there an and? What, what more would you need? There was a wipeout of the locust. God restored. Our crops are back. Our threshing floor is back. Our vats are back. Our oil is back. Our wine is back. Our, our grapes are back. We're good. He says, no, no, no. That's not the end goal. It's just to get the vats full. There's something more. And he says in uh, this verse, uh, verse 28, he says, and 
So I'm gonna do that, but I'm gonna do something else. And the something else is really crazy. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I'll show you wonders in the heavens. And on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. It's like, hello, we've had some blood moons, Louis. Before the coming of the great, hello, and dreadful day of the Lord. Can I just read this sentence maybe one more time? Before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Last verse of Joel. Their blood guilt, which I have not pardoned, I will pardon. The Lord dwells in Zion. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance. Now, now something powerful is happening here. Joel is saying that there is a time coming. So yes, thank you, God, that our vats are full. Thank you, God, that our account is full. Thank you, God, that... that our, our, our stake is, is, is back up. Thank, thank you for, for restoring. Thank you for repaying. Thank you for that. But there's something more to life than just having your vats full. And it is that God's gonna pour out his spirit on everybody. This would be absolutely shocking to the hearer because it, a shift is happening where the Spirit of God, which is now calling for prophecy, which is a witness to Christ, is moving from the prophet, who's been a witness to Christ, to the people who are now the witness to Christ. It used to be the big hitters. Now it's everybody. The Spirit of God now is on everyone to do what? To prophesy. You say, prophesy sounds scary, Louis. I don't really know about prophecy. I don't know about all that and what that means. Simplest definition from Strong's exhaustive concordance is prophesy means to speak or sing by inspiration in prediction or in simple discourse. You're like, oh, I don't know, I don't, didn't grow up in that church. You know how to prophesy. Prophesy is when you say, well, I'll tell you what I think. Okay, prophesy. Or uh, let me tell you what you should do. Okay, go ahead, prophesy. Or even more, when you say, you know what, I just had a hunch. I have a feeling, I don't know, but I don't think that camping thing, I don't have a good feeling about that. Okay, prophesy. We, we prophesy all the time. But what the text is now saying is that when the Spirit of God comes on us, on our sons and daughters, men and women, all of us included in this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that we become witnesses to Christ. So there's an antichrist coming, but there are witnesses to Christ coming also. There's an antichrist spirit that's going to try to shut down the whole world, but there is a for Christ spirit that is now influencing all the people of God to see Christ and to proclaim Christ under the influence of the Spirit of God. That's why when the Holy Spirit came in Acts 2, is exactly what it looked like. We see these two things again. Uh, we see being drunk and being filled with the Spirit in the same text again, right next to each other. Uh, it's, 
festival time. They're Jews from all over the known world in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit comes down in the upper room. These followers of Jesus who've been waiting on the Holy Spirit now are touched with these tongues of fire that came from heaven, and they all started proclaiming the gospel in different languages, and all the people who were there were like, what is going on? All these people are Galileans. We know that, but they're telling us the gospel in our own languages right now. What is happening? And there was a smart aleck there that got recorded by Luke, and that person said, I think they're all drunk. And Peter, who just a few weeks before denied Jesus, stood up. And he spoke to them, and he said, they're not drunk, it's only nine in the morning. I always have to add it. Some of you went to UGA, and you've seen people drunk at nine in the morning, and so that's not necessarily a wash that they assumed that. (laughs) No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. And he comes down to verse 21, this little section. He's quoting all of what we just read. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You're like, okay, well, which Lord? I mean, Lord, God. Okay, everybody, call on God. Call on the Lord. No, then he says very clearly in verse 22, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Turn the page. He comes a little further down, connecting more and more prophecy. And then he comes down and he calls for them to repent and to call on the name of Jesus. And thousands of people in that moment, under the powerful preaching of the Holy Spirit, had their hearts cracked open and put their faith and their trust in Jesus. And the church is born in this moment. And they are Bold in the face of even death. They don't flinch. They keep pointing in the antichrist darkness to the light of Christ who is alive from the dead. And the church is born on hostile ground. And it explodes around the world. It wasn't very big got a lot bigger after Peter's sermon, but it wasn't super big on day one, just a couple thousand people on earth in it. But it was strong and it was bold. And this is what God is calling for as the dreadful day nears. So passion always preaches, be excellent in what you do. Credibility gains you an opportunity to share your story of faith with people who don't even wanna hear about your story of faith, i.e. you're the best architect in California and everybody thinks that you are the deal and now here comes some very talented person who wants to be an intern with you and they're not interested at all in the things of God or the gospel, but they're interested in you and they want to come and study under you because you're the best and at some point you have an opportunity because of your credibility to say to them, well, you know, the reason why what I get inspired by most in doing the architecture I'm doing is my relationship with God um, and he inspires me and I want to reflect his beauty and creativity and all the things that I do and that's how, you know, I approach every single project and they don't say to you, I don't want to hear any more about your faith. They just go, great, you can talk about your faith because I want this internship really, really bad and I respect you a lot. That's why it's important to be great at whatever you do because it gains you credibility with people around you and gives you opportunities to share the gospel. But it can't stop with, hey, people see the way I live. People, people see my example. People know that I don't treat our employees like other people treat their employees. They know that we're different. They can sense there's different. At some point, we actually have to prophesy 
Because yes, the Holy Spirit influences us to live lives in the light and not the dark, to live holy lives that reflect the holiness of God. But the Holy Spirit also leads us to, to prophesy. And the Spirit now is moved from the prophet <laughs> to the people. I wish I could get off this stage really quick, but I don't have time. I gotta wrap up and just touch lightly every single person unless you look at me and say, don't touch me. And then I'll just stand near you and just say, you, and on 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 you. The Spirit's coming. Prophesy, prophesy. Prophesy, prophesy, prophesy. The darkness is coming. The Antichrist is on the move. The spirit of Antichrist is now. Prophesy to Christ in the face of the Antichrist. Prophesy to Christ in the face of the Antichrist. Prophesy at work. Prophesy in the street. Prophesy in your neighborhood. Prophesy at the coffee shop. Prophesy to the person that you meet on the way. Prophesy to your family. Prophesy because the great and dreadful day of the Lord is coming. You're like, Louis, if I talk about Jesus, I'm going to get hit for that. Take that and count that as gain and a witness against the great and dreadful day of the Lord when you will be able to say, I prophesied. I did prophesy and you heard me testify about him. But how can it end up for them that they're separated from God? I don't know. That's a shame because so many people prophesied about Jesus. The last thing, just quickly, is what does church look like? It looks like everybody's all in. I had this in my notes different in the other gathering. I had it as deeply rooted and connected and just shifting a little bit in between to church after pandemic looks like everybody's all in. In other words, church becomes a way of life, not a weekly gathering. So, you know, a lot of people left church during pandemic. I don't know why they all left. A hundred reasons probably. And some of them didn't come back and maybe they didn't come back for a hundred reasons. But maybe one of the reasons, I don't, I don't know. Maybe one of the reasons was is that they left church and they were gone for a few months and they realized they didn't really miss church at all. They're like, I don't know. I don't feel really any different from being there. Why? Because maybe we package this thing to be a moment and we work really hard in that moment to lift your spirit so that you leave here going, I feel better about myself and about life than I did when I went in. I got a boost. And maybe there's a practical nugget for you that you can use during the week. And that's church. I'm telling you, that kind of church isn't gonna make it when the spirit of Antichrist tries to shut down the world. That's, that kind of church isn't gonna make it through the pandemic. That kind of church isn't gonna make it through a diagnosis. It's not gonna make it through something that doesn't make sense. It's not gonna make it through hardship or difficulty or persecution. That kind of church won't make it. The kind of church is gonna make it is the church where people in the church are all in to church. You're like, are you trying to get us to show up now? No, no, no. Opposite. I'm trying to say that it's not most about how many people come through the door. It's most about what kind of people go out the door. And we obviously want to make room for a lot more people in this house. But not people who just come and sit in a seat and feel a little bit better when they leave and think that's church because you're deceiving yourself. 
together, we move. The church that was born under the people who were prophesying by the influence of the Holy Spirit devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. Everyone was filled with awe. And many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Holy Spirit, prophet to people, prophesying salvation, church. And the church is all in. That's what Joel was saying. He calls it out at the end. And he says, for on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance. Can I just show you this super fast and then we're, we're, we're out. It's a talk that God, maybe God gave me. I think people say God gave me this message. He's like, I didn't give you that. Uh, so I don't know if God gave it to me or not, but I thought he did um, for this summer. And it's a talk called um, The Wedge or The Wheel. And the talk centers around my life and a lot of our view of Christianity. You know, I have my family, I have my job, I didn't quite get my pie right, I have my fitness, I have my social life, I have my friends, I got my finances. But man, something's missing. And then I heard about Jesus. And I was like, yes. And I invited Jesus into my life. And I just said, you go crazy in here. Just have your way. But you're learning in time that that sounded like a great plan, but it didn't work because the Holy Spirit doesn't fill wedges. The Holy Spirit fills wheels. And there's something else that's called your life. Jesus' life. My life is your life. All of it. Um, my family, I want you to be all up in that. I want you to be up in my friends. I want you to be up in my fitness. I want you to be up in my finances. I want you to be up in my social life. I want you to be up in my work life. I want you to be up in my knitting circle. I want you to get in every bit of it. I'm not giving you a wedge. I'm giving you the whole thing. And, and what that looks like is it turns everything upside down. And you go from a faith that looked like that and didn't work to a faith that looks like this. So what are you, you still got a wedge. No, I turned my wedge into a mountain. This is Mount Zion. That's where the deliverance happened, on Mount Zion. But three other important things happened on Mount Zion because Mount Zion is also called Mount Moriah. And on Mount Moriah, a man named Abraham took his miracle son to make an offering to God. At the end of the day, he didn't know what he was supposed to offer, so he was willing to offer his miracle son that he had. He was willing to, to offer everything. And there was a, a, a ram uh, with his horns caught in a bush at the last second. And he realized that God had provided and he called this place Jireh. And we sing about it to this day. In 2 Samuel, David went up to the exact same mountaintop on Mount Moriah. He went to make an offering to God. God had called him to make an offering and he came to a man 
named Aruna who owned a threshing floor and he said, what are you doing here, King David? He said, the Lord wanted me to make an offering and I'm gonna do it right here. He said, great, you can have the land, you can have my wood, you can have my animals, everything I have is yours. And David said, oh no, 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 I'm gonna buy all this because I'm not offering a sacrifice to God that cost me nothing. And David bought it all and made the sacrifice right there on the top of Mount Moriah. In 2 Chronicles, Solomon built a temple. Do you know where he built it? On Aruna's threshing floor. And he gave generously of his gold and his silver and his bronze and his wealth. He went all in to build this temple on Mount Moriah. You know what we're learning? Is it up on Mount Moriah on the mountaintop? It's not uh, Kumbaya. It's not uh, all feel good and goosebumps and emotions and big hugs on, on the mountaintop. Oh, we went to the retreat, had a mountaintop experience. Well, really? Because mountaintops are not about Kumbaya. Mountaintops are, are about understanding that all worship involves sacrifice. And so Jesus said to his followers, come, let's go up to Jerusalem. You know why? Because Mount Moriah is also called Mount Zion. And on the top of Mount Zion is where Jerusalem is. And Jesus said, let's go up. Same mountain Abraham went up, same mountain David went up, same mountain Solomon went up, let's go up. And he said, when we get there, guys, the son of man is gonna be handed over to the high priest, falsely accused, gonna be stripped, gonna be beaten, gonna be spit on, gonna be nailed to a cross. Son of man is gonna die on a cross. The son of man is gonna be put in a tomb and the son of man in three days is gonna rise from the dead. And up on the exact same spot, as the Holy of Holies, Aruna's threshing floor, and Abraham's altar, Jehovah Jireh, God provides, God did provide. And this time, he gave everything. And he said, guys, I am all in. Welcome church. Welcome to the mountaintop. Church is all in, and it doesn't work any other way. Christianity doesn't work any other way. Some of you have been wondering, you know, what's wrong with me? I'm a defective Christian, or Christianity is defective, one or the other. No, it's just that your kind of Christianity is defective. (laughs) It's the wedge and not the wheel. And God is saying, I wanna invite you in. I want you to be rooted in this word. In this word, I want you to root in this word. I don't want you to follow a man. I want you to follow this word. Because you can go find a church and a preacher who will amen whatever it is that you want amen in your life. You can find a church and a preacher who will Say, yes, I agree with you and will amen whatever it is that you feel like is right for you. You need to get filled with the Spirit and get in this Word and get around people who are filled with the Spirit and are in this Word and submit yourself to one another under the Spirit and this Word. We will preach it. This church will follow it. We will build on it. But you need to be knitted into a community of Spirit-filled, Word-soaked people who are awake and alert and who are wise and who understand what the will of the Lord is and know what time it is on planet earth and who are wide awake at the dawn of the end of time. Wake up. Wake up. 